Okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Percy, who's giving a uh, guest lecture. For those of you who are in the course, uh, just a reminder that the poster session is on Wednesday um, next week, and your final project is due uh, the following, um, or two weeks from, from two days ago, or on Monday. Um, but uh, really excited to introduce Percy. Percy is an associate professor here at Stanford. Uh, he's done some really cool work in machine learning and natural language processing, uh, both on the theoretical side as well as the empirical side, and also has most recently started the Stanford Center for Research on Foundation Models, uh, which has also been uh, kind of a really cool effort going on, is also pretty related to some of the topics in the course as well. So yeah, looking forward to his talk. Great. All right, thanks Chelsea for the introduction and uh, thanks everyone for coming. I think you guys have seen in context learning a little bit. I saw it in one of the slides. Um, so hopefully we'll uh, do a little bit more of a deep dive here. Um, so the story starts in 2020. So a bunch of people at OpenAI decided to gather a ton of data, text data on the internet, and construct a big transformer, and ask the model to do one simple thing, which is predict the next word over and over again, over every single token on this data set. And they ran it on, I think, something like 10,000 GPUs for several months. And I think all of you know, uh, have you know, probably seen or uh, played with GPT-3. But the, the result I want to focus on is this uh, ability to do in-context learning. So what is in-context learning, just as a review? It's the idea that you can prompt a language model with a string, which is a concatenation of a bunch of examples, that's something that looks like this, with a new test example, and ask the model to produce the answer. So if you think about this, this is sort of crazy. You know, why would this, you expect that to work? Because language model isn't supposed to generate language. It's not really supposed to solve any sort of tasks, let alone do some kind of meta learning. And OK, you might think, well, this is because there's lots of examples that look like this on the internet. So I should probably just copy something. OK, so really tried hard to see if we could break it. So here's a task. We prompt it with input, uh, here's a date, and output. You know, we want to come up with something that was definitely not on the internet as of 2021. And um, it could reformat dates in this way as well. Okay, so for those non-believers who think like, well, okay, GPT-3, they've trained on the internet, they're just memorizing. Well, this is a clear demonstration that's not just memorizing. It's actually learning some abstraction that's helping it solve these tasks, okay? And, and the scale matters here. So this is from the original GPT-3 paper. If you were playing around with uh, small one billion parameter models, you could see that nothing was really working at all. And it's only when you get up to 175 billion in that case, um, you could get in context learning. So th this is simply mind blowing. And ever since I've been obsessed with the problem of figuring out why it's, uh, this works. This is not the way the machine learning is supposed to work. So uh, hopefully we can try to understand a little bit of this in our talk here. And why in-context learning is, matters, and it's not just a random curiosity. There's two reasons, scientific and practical. The, on the scientific front, this is an examine, example of emergent phenomenon. So GPT-3 was not built to do in-context learning. The developers did not say, oh, we want in-context learning, so therefore we're going to train it in this way. It just sort of emerged from uh, somehow, from the data. Second, there's a sort of conventional wisdom in machine learning that you train and then you test. And if you train, distribution is like your test distribution. Then you win. Otherwise, all bets are off. And this is going to be farther from that setting where the training distribution is predicting next word. And the test is this wide range of downstream tasks, some of which have never been seen at training time. And yet, something is still working. And the, the interesting thing about emergence is that you know, here we have in-context learning, which is going to occupy the whole uh, of this talk. But what else is there? People have looked at other emergent behavior like chain of thought and so on. And so there's a very vast um, uh, set of capabilities that we're barely scratching the surface of. And then there's a practical concern uh, or um, aspect, which is that in context learning really presents a paradigm shift in the way I think we build ML or AI systems. So now you can prototype new tasks in the afternoon rather than you know, setting up some elaborate data collection process. 
So it kind of changes the way that you even approach things. And you know, I, I think it's also important to realize that in the real world, things don't come prepackaged with, oh, here's a data set I can just download uh, from Hugging Face and just run it. But if you're actually trying to solve a real problem, there's usually a kind of a vague idea of what you want to do, maybe some messy data. And this idea of fast and quick prototyping using these language models, I think, uh, allows you to get a lot farther than if your first step was to collect a bunch of data and label it. OK, so diving a little bit into details. Um, so there's a, a contrast here, two types of learning. The first is what I call standard learning. It's gradient-based, which is everyone's familiar with that. You take gradients. Um, in context learning, the key operation is not gradient uh, descent, but conditioning. So in the language model, remember, it's a distribution over a sequence of tokens. So what you're really doing is conditioning on a sequence of tokens and then asking the model to predict the next uh, thing. OK, so we'll come back to the issue of conditioning in the second part of the talk. And since this is a meta-learning class, I thought I'd try to clarify the relationship between meta-learning and context learning, which often it gets blurred. So there's a form of meta-learning, which you guys talked about, which is black box meta-learning. And I think of meta-learning as talking about the framework of um, you have a training data that has maybe a collection of tasks, and you want to do some sort of training procedure so that the model, in this case a black box model, um, can do learning on new tasks. So I think about this is the connection between you know, the training and, the, and inference time. And into context learning really refers to the ability that a model has. Um, and you know, independent of where it came from. So we can talk about the in-context learning ability of a transformer that was, I don't know, hand-coded or learned from uh, supervised examples or from language modeling uh, objectives. Okay. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. OK, so in order to understand in context learning, I want to break things down into two pieces. One is just the question of how a fixed model, you know, never mind where it came from, how can a fixed model even perform in context learning? Because this is just a giant transformer. It's getting fed in a bunch of uh, you know, sequence of examples, and it has to do something, some you know, association between the x and some um, y's um, to be able to predict. So how is that possible? And the second question is, how do you get one of these models from training, let's say, on next word prediction? So I'm not going to answer these two questions fully, but we're going to try to make some progress. And how can we make some progress? Well, there's, there's many things going on with uh, GPT-3. So let me try to break it down. So there's a question of data. You know, the GPT-3 was trained on a large uh, web crawl. You know, what is necessary there. Can we demonstrate in context learning with synthetic data? There's a question of model architecture. So we've seen in context learning working for transformers. What about RNNs or mixture of experts? Um, and then there's a training objective. Does it have to be autoaggressive? Can it be sort of like a contrastive or mass language model objective? Um, and then there, there's a question of you know, how do you study in each of these components? Um, you can understand things theoretically, where we develop a toy model, and then you can you know, prove analytically why in-context learning works. Um, or you can run synthetic uh, experiments, where you develop a simple model, and you can run things so you can get you know, clean conclusions. And then there's real-world experiments, where you're running things on real language. And, so, um, and there's trade-offs. Right? Ultimately, we want it to be in the real world, but this is really messy. And it's also very expensive because, remember, in-context learning only shows up at scale. So you can't really hope to do uh, that many real-world e experiments. Um, so what we're going to focus on is the bolded uh, pieces here. We're going to look at synthetic experiments and do a little bit of theory to understand in-context learning both the architecture and the data. So we're going to talk about uh, two works. Um, the first is. Uh, trying to get at the architecture question. And the second is trying to get at the data question. OK, so uh, the first paper is with uh, Shivam Dimitris and uh, Greg Valiant, appearing at NeurIPS. Um, OK, so in-context learning is um, 
you can solve all these different tasks, but you know, there's a nagging question that I think I alluded to earlier, which are these models actually doing any learning at all, or is it just pattern matching? You know, you should be really suspicious of these language models. Um, so what we want to do is formalize the problem a bit, right? Because I think in context learning, like what's the definition? So here is a definition um, which captures, I think, an L, um, you know, at least one aspect of it. So you can think about in context learning of a function class. So this is hailing back to kind of what people do in statistical learning theory, where what does it mean to learn? It's you define a function class, and you get examples from that class, and then you see if your learning algorithm can figure out which function it is. Okay, so we're gonna play the same game here. So for example, linear functions, a set of all linear functions in let's say 20 dimensions. Uh, you sample a function, and then you're going to sample um, random inputs. So these are gonna be vectors that are d-dimensional. And we're, I'm gonna say, okay, here's x1. I'm gonna apply the function to x1, here's x2, apply the function to x2. And these are going to be inputs into a model, and I want the model to be able to output the corresponding function value of uh, the last input here. Okay, and the model architecture we're gonna look at for this uh, talk, uh, this first part of the talk is a transformer. Um, it's worth noting that the x is a real value, so this is not going to be a language transformer. Here, x is just going to be, I mean, it's, it's basically the word embedding, treated as a word embedding layer for the, the transformer. And instead of outputting you know, softmax over tokens, we're gonna to have this transformer just directly have, attach a linear layer and actually ask it to do regression using the squared loss. Okay, so slightly deviation from actually a pure language model, so this is why we're just talking about transformers as opposed to language models. There's no language or text here at all. Okay, so then what are we gonna do? Um, we're gonna build this transformer by uh, sampling functions over and over again. Um, and for each function, we're going to sample data for that function and then ask the transformer to reconstruct the labels um, in the data. Okay, this is gonna be do doing uh, from scratch uh, just to make it very clear what's, what's, what's going on rather than uh, uh, pre-training and fine-tuning. Okay, so what can uh, this train transformer do? So let's start with linear functions. In 20 dimension, um, this plot shows as you increase the number of in-context examples, um, you know, what is the error rate on the kind of the fresh uh, draw? And here we're looking at um, uh, least squares, um, and this is what you would expect. There's no noise in the problem, so the dimensionality is 20, which means that if you get 20 points, then you basically know the function, and least squares is optimal. You can't do better than that. And here the transformer is actually able to match the implementation of least squares. And just to check, we do some naive things like averaging and nearest neighbors, and they just don't work. Right, so the transformer seems to be uh, mimicking the behavior of the optimal algorithm here, least squares. So, okay, so this was pretty cool. But you might still be suspicious. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it just saw enough examples and it just kind of memorized all the possible linear functions. If you do the math, there are a lot of linear functions, even if they're epsilon close, like it's you know, cursive dimensionality, you know, exponential 120 is pretty big. So it's definitely not seen all the um, you know, linear functions. Um, but, you know, you should still be suspicious, and so let's probe it a little bit, okay? So how, yeah? How do you measure if it's doing these squares? Are you like measuring if it's outputting the pseudo inverse or something like that? So the question is, how do you know if it's doing least squares? So we're only looking at the prediction error. So it's most certainly not implementing the least squares algorithm, and I'll show you, uh, you know, for a fact. Um, but it's, at least on this distribution, it's uh, behaving like uh, if you had run these squares. Yeah, question back. Does the order of the input examples um, matter in this case, or if you like, reordered uh, the inputs like the x1, x2, xk you were showing, yeah. were they in some particular order, or could you shuffle them and kind of get the same results? Yeah, so the question is, does the order of the examples matter? In this case, it doesn't really matter because 
each of these x's are actually generally drawn ID. Um, so there's no information in the ordering. OK, so let's try to probe it. And the way to really check whether a, you know, this model is able to do inconsequent learning is let's try to give it inputs that it hasn't seen at training time. Not, not just hasn't seen, but it's a different distribution. And the, the distributions here are a little bit complicated, so let me try to uh, talk through it. So there's the distribution over x's at um, test time. So when I say test and train, I really mean meta test and meta train. Um, just, and when I say query, that's like the, the, I guess maybe what you would call the, the test point. Um, so uh, there's a distribution of x's, there's a distribution over the y's given by the function, and then there's this query uh, point. Okay, so I'm gonna change these, and, and for, there's basically these distributions for meta test, and then there's also these distributions for meta train. So there's really like six different, different distributions that we can vary. Um, so here's one starting point. So remember at training time, meta training time, we draw um, examples just from a standard Gaussian. And at test time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give these X's, which are the in-context examples, they're gonna come from a different quadrant um, or orthant than the query. Okay, so let's see what happens. In this case, it degrades a little bit, but it's basically matching the behavior of least squares. Maybe this transition isn't as sharp and needs a few more examples to figure out what's going on, but not too bad. What happens if we, um, you know, remember in training time we had the identity covariance, and at test time, all the X's and the Q's are going to be drawn from a, a different covariance distribution, where the covariance is uh, skewed. And here you definitely get some deg degradation. So it doesn't hit zero as it should. Um, least squares would hit zero because, well, there's no training uh, in, in least squares or no meta training in least squares. It's a fixed algorithm. And so, it, but it's not bad. Okay, so this is why it's not exactly least squares, but it's a sort of approximately least squares. So here's something really interesting. So what happens if you add label noise at, uh, inference time. So in training, there's no noise. So we're using the same transformer here. And at test time, you do add some label noise. So here, least squares is actually going to not work because if your least squares actually blows up here, and um, this is a phenomenon called double descent, which has been you know, pretty well studied in um, learning theory. Um, and the transformer, interestingly, has a similar spike. Okay, so this is sort of interesting. I mean, this is, I guess, I don't know if this is good or bad, but at least qualitatively, it has some similarities to um, least squares, at least as measured by this kind of reaction against noise, um, even though it's not exactly least squares. Okay, so the conclusion there is that, yeah, sort of works um, like um, least squares. So what about going beyond linear uh, function classes? So let's look at sparse functions. So in the sparse function, the f's um, have zeros in a lot of places on the wave vector except for maybe three entries. So here the optimal thing is not least squares. Least squares is gonna take 20 examples to figure out what the solution is. It's the lasso algorithm, which does L1 regularization. And here we show that the transformer actually learns to behave like the lasso. So this is pretty cool because now the transformer is able to learn kind of non-trivial, I mean the lasso is not a trivial algorithm and exploding sparsity is not trivial, so it's able to do that, which is pretty cool. Note that we did have to train the transformer to do this, so it's not, it's not magic. Um, otherwise it wouldn't know about sparsity at all. What about uh, two-layer ReLU networks? So here the baseline that we looked at is gradient descent and it basically matches gradient descent. So that's, uh, that's nice. Um, yeah? Was it, did you try the original um, transformer that you trained on non-sparse things and see if it matched the least squares? So the question is if- I took the original transformer and applied it to the sparse question. Uh, so this should match the, the least squares um, objective. Um, 
because you know this this is sort of sparse linear function is just a special case of linear functions, and we already know that um, the previous transformer acted like least squares on a fairly wide range of uh, distributions. Yeah. So I have one question about the label noise from earlier. What kind of model of noise was it? Was it always oh, Gaussian noise? Yeah, yeah. So the label noise is just adding uh, Gaussian noise. How long would it work? Would you expect if you give like a complete outlier just for one of the y's? So the question is, how well it work if you gave it uh, one y, which is way out there? Um, that would probably break least squares, uh, because least, unless you regularize. So least squares is no regularization, right? It's not rich regression. So it's going to just be thrown off by that label. And the transformer, um, we didn't do that exact experiment, but I imagine that it would be also uh, you know, uh, distracted. Yeah, Chelsea. Um, given that like these squares is kind of the optimal solution when you don't have noise, like do you think that these sorts of findings are surprising? Like I, I guess I would, I think yeah. I guess do you think it's surprising or like or did any of these results kind of differ from what you were expecting? So the question is basically is this result surprising? Um, it was not obvious to me that this transformer would have this type of behavior. Um, and in fact, I'm not going to talk about this, but we also ran experiments with LSTMs. And LSTMs look like transformers on the in distribution, but on this case, LSTMs did not have the double descent. So it's pretty non obvious, I think, that you know, the there's some dependence on the architecture, depending on, like, different architecture have a different inductive bias, which will lead to different quote unquote algorithms that it's learning. Is that just because the transformer is fitting the data better? Like, is it a better universal function approximator, basically? Is, so the question is, is that because a transformer is just um, fitting, the training. fitting the training data? I don't think so. I think it is inductive bias because we did, I mean, the, the, there's still more work to be done, but I, we tried to make the LSTM large so it's, it wasn't like a capacity issue. It could be a training. LSTMs are hard you know, to train, so not, not quite sure. Yeah? The intuition behind why double descent happens. Um, this is maybe a longer uh, question, so maybe we should take that offline. But basically, I guess one um, quick, quick answer is that in the over-parameterized regime, so statistically, what you would expect is like, OK, you fit, and then you start overfitting when there's noise. If there's no noise, then there's, then there's no overfitting, because you just nail that. And what people have observed is that over-parameterization uh, you know, when the number of dimensions is larger than the number of examples, you get, kind of get this um, sort of optimal error. But you know, happy to chat more later. We should uh, let me go, uh, go on since uh, we have a lot to cover. But good questions. Um, okay, so finally we look at decision trees. So for decision trees, we looked at the greedy algorithm, the XG boost, which is the state of our decision tree um, learning algorithm. And here the transformer actually outperforms. Um, the, the XGB, at least on this sort of synthetic uh, data distribution. So this is not claiming that you should ditch XGBoost and use this transformer. Um, but this was sort of curious, I think, that the transformer is able to learn some sort of algorithm, at least on this distribution, it's outperforming sort of hand-coded algorithms, so to speak. Um, model size clearly matters. Um, but what's interesting is that Model size is especially important when you look at kind of robustness and extrapolation to out of distribution. Um, you know, for standard, it seems like okay, there's a steady um, improvement as you increase the model size, but it sort of really matters if you're uh, extrapolating. Um, okay, so let me summarize. So one conceptual important thing to take away is that we're defining in context learning of a function class. So this is sort of a, maybe an important concept, not to think about in-context learning as like some fuzzy thing, but we're talking about uh, rigorously in-context learning of a function class. And this is a property of a model. Um, but in order to sort of prove the existence of these models, we can train a transformers to do in-context learning on these linear functions. We saw we could do sparse linear functions, neural networks, decision trees. We also evaluate the robustness out of these true prompts which I think is really crucial if you want to understand 
um, because many of the differences between model size and LSTMs versus transformers, you don't really see unless you go out of distribution because that's where the inductive biases really kick in. And I think it's sort of interesting to think about what algorithms these transformers are representing. Um, there's still a lot of open questions here. Um, this model, when you condition on these in-context examples, is a function. It's not a linear function, certainly, um, but it is a function that sort of local, um, in, I think within a ball, behaves sort of linearly. And it would be interesting to understand what function that actually is. Uh, I alluded to RNNs and LSTMs. Um, how much of this is specific to transformers as opposed to other architectures? Um, how can we look underneath the hood to see what the transformers are actually doing mechanistically? There's this follow-up paper, I think, which is really interesting, where they actually are able to construct a transformer by setting its weights somehow um, and show that that can do uh, linear regression. Um, they also do some more like probing experiments to look inside the transformer, whereas we are only looking at uh, behaviors. Um, what question is, you know, can we get algorithmic insights? So this is something I'm kind of excited about because, um, you know, this will maybe teach us something about algorithm, you know, design. And the idea that the decision trees case, the transformer was actually able to do so much better suggests maybe there are other sort of algorithms or principles here that we can pull out. Um, and finally, this is all on synthetic tasks. It would be great to tie this back into real tasks with knowledge. And the exclusion of knowledge here is deliberate here because we wanted to understand in context learning, the, really the learning part. And this is sort of, you can think about this as a pure learning. Like all we know is this is a learning function, there's no knowledge, it's just like figure out what the linear function is. This is just learning. A lot of the in-context examples that you see in literature bring in prior knowledge um, about um, you know, translation. There's no way, obviously, you can learn how to translate sentences from five examples. It has to be knowledge. And how does that work in conjunction with this learning ability? That's, I think, a really interesting question. Um, question back there? Yeah, just a quick one here. Uh, it seems like there is some threshold, right, based on model uh, size and the number of parameters which point in context learning happens. In this work, did you do an analysis on that? Like, for instance, if you reduced uh, the number of parameters you had in your model, would it not learn to do this lasso type regression? Um, you know, is there a way to estimate how many parameters you need for, for your model given yeah. some level of task difficulty? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, you know, basically how big of a model do you need for certain types of behaviors? Um, we have this experiment, which is show that, I mean, size definitely does matter. I think it would be really interesting to do a more careful scaling laws type of analysis where you train a sequence of models from small to large, and maybe you um, increase the depth or the number of tension heads and look at these sort of dimensions of scaling, and then track the different types of uh, behaviors, like did it learn the lasso, did it um, you know, match, uh, does it have double descent, and so on. Um, yeah, that would be. Interesting follow-up work. Yeah. So like wondering does this show any correlation or any reason that some studies that relate in context learning from transformers to graph neural networks? So the question is transformers can be seen as a special case of graph neural networks. Are there any works that explore in context learning with graph neural networks? Um, I think that, I mean, there, there's independently, I think, interest in thinking about how you do in-context learning with graph structured data, um, which uh, you know, is, I think, interesting to explore. I think here, um, you know, I, I guess there's, you know, the graph, is, I guess, with the best sense, what you're trying to get out of the graph um, neural network. Here, there's, you know, you have a sequence of XY pairs, and there is, in some sense, a symmetry. There's sort of all K square different kind of connections that make sense. Um, so I don't know if there would be a natural graph structure. I guess that the asymmetry between the X and the Y tokens maybe matter, so you could try to sparsify the graph 
or play with attention heads, um, you know, somehow. Um, I mean, a broader question is, you know, the transformer has, you know, we have positional embeddings here, which seems rather unnatural from the point of view of um, it's not order invariant. And someone asked about the, the, the dependence on uh, ordering of examples. Maybe you can build that invariance um, directly into the model. Any other questions? Yeah. Experiments without the positional encoding, it's like, like it's, it still works without that, right? Um, so the question is, do you did I, we do an experiments without the positional encoding? Um, it wouldn't work because then you don't know which y goes with which x. Because if it's just a bag of x y pairs, you don't. Oh, okay. So yeah. like your x and y's are separated. Yeah, they're separate tokens. Okay, but like you would pair yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so to the outline. So we talked about um, what transformers can learn in context. Looking at, um, I think about it really as an architectural question. Can the transformer do certain things? And doing a bunch of ex synthetic experiments on well-defined function classes to explore the limits of transformers. Now let's try to understand uh, the role of data, although the way we'll kind of get at the data maybe is not what you think it would be. Um, so this is a iClear paper with uh, Michael Shea, Aditi, Raghunathan, and Tanya Ma. And remember there's two types of learning. Standard learning, you think about gradients. Um, and in context learning is this maybe weird thing where you condition to do learning. But maybe it's not actually that weird if you think about it with your, with a Bayesian, through a Bayesian lens. And if you think about Bayesian inference, um, which uh, might be, you know, a different paradigm for, you know, the, the I guess the, you know, the norm um, in ML th these days. Um, so let's walk through what Bayesian inference is. So imagine you have a latent a random variable theta, which is, corresponds to a, a task. You can think about it as a function, a linear function if you want, um, which is unknown. That's why it's not shaded. And you think about the, the building a generative model over what, um, okay, that's generative model is overloaded these days. Let's build a probabilistic and, um, framework for thinking about how theta is related to uh, variables. So here's a simple example. Suppose that we have x1 and y1. So um, Suppose you, know, you can generate x1 or you can just condition on it. It doesn't matter. Um, but, but the point is that y is uh, generated given x and theta. And independently for each of the k examples, we have <coughs> y um, given x and theta. And then you have a query point, which is just another ID example. And it's, uh, you ask, what is the probability of y query given x query and theta? And now, now, of course, you don't know what theta is. So being a good Bayesian, you would just try to marginalize it out. And that's what this equation does. So this is a very classic kind of Bayesian um, analysis where you have um, this posterior distribution where you condition on everything that you observe, which is this. And then you look at the posterior distribution over theta. So you're trying to guess what theta is, and then you basically kind of weight um, your prediction. So this is the prediction. If you had theta, how would I predict on y query given x query? Um, and you're basically averaging over possible values of theta, which where the averaging is given by the posterior. So this object in, in Bayesian analysis is called the posterior predictive distribution. It doesn't have a theta in it because it's been marginalized out. So it just looks like x1, y1, all the way to xk, yk, x query, and probably distribution of y query, right? And this is exactly the same form that we've been playing around with when we talk about doing in-context learning. Okay? So from through this lens, what we can think about in-context learning or these transformers doing is that they're trying to fit this posterior predictive distribution directly. Okay, but 
there could be this underlying structure here that is latent. But the transformer you know, it doesn't care. It's just going to fit this distribution. And maybe it has some notion of implicitly theta. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? So what will be um, useful to think about is this posterior predictive distribution. And we're going to start a kind of abstracting away from the architecture. And it, it, we're just going to talk about the distribution. OK. So remember our questions. You know, how can a fixed model, a transformer, perform in context learning? And the first part of the talk shows some empirical evidence that the transformer can do in context learning in a fairly wide number of non-trivial settings. Um, and if you are shown examples of uh, the task, essentially. Now, there's some extrapolation to all out of domain, but largely you're showing the transformer, here's how what linear regression you know, looks like. And so you can think about through this lens is, well, I just, um, this is the model, I mean, accurate depiction of um, the linear regression setup um, if for appropriate choices of distributions. And so you can think about it. What we're doing is we're just fitting this distribution. And if you believe that the transformer is some universal function approximator, if you give enough data, it should just work, right? I think it's still it's not trivial um, that it can do it in a reasonable amount of time because you know the universe. I mean, you can invoke universal function approximator, but you know this is a pretty could be a pretty complex function. So that, that the transformer can learn it and you can actually run SGD to do it is not obvious. That's what the first part of the talk showed that it's you know it, it sort of works. Um, but now. We're going to move on to the second question is, how does this model arise from training? And, and the key thing is that, you know, remember in GPT-3, it's just training on next word prediction. So it's, a very, it's not explicitly training for these tasks, which is the whole point of the emergent behavior. And this is really, the, I think, the harder question, or conceptually harder question to ask. OK, so the main challenge here is this distribution shift, right? We're training on, basically, internet crawl. And we're prompting it with um, examples that don't show up at training or even out of distribution. So the pre-training distribution is not the same as the prompting distribution and can be actually pretty wildly different. So in what settings can this actually work? So we're going to try to make some progress by defining a simple model where the pre-training distribution and the prompting distribution differ in a well-controlled way. And then we're going to see if we can make some progress. Okay. So we're going to consider pre-training distribution as a mixture of HMMs. And the idea is that you have this, uh, this concept, theta, that encodes, for example, the topic. Like, oh, this is a, a Wikipedia biography, let's say. And then given that, which encodes, let's say, the transitions of HMM, then we're going to generate text from that HMM. Okay, so to generate a document, you first sample transitions from this HMM, and then you're going to sample um, the hidden states from HMM, and then do the sample of the emissions given the, 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 trans, um, the hidden states. Okay, and then you get your text, and you remember you hide theta because you don't see it. But that's the data generating process for the pre training data. Okay. So now let's think about what language modeling would try to do if it's asked to pr just predict this text. I would argue that it implicitly tr has to infer the target concept somehow. Um, I know this is a little bit hand wavy, but you know, bear with me. So if you have this article about Albert Einstein, it, it kind of needs to figure out, OK, well, this is probably like a Wikipedia biography and invoke you know, I'm going to generate things that look like Wikipedia biographies. So the LM will probably try to implicitly infer theta approximately somehow, and then uh, try to sample from the HMM. So of, of course, the transformer is not literally doing this, but this is just a kind of a um, cartoon of what it might be thinking. OK, so now what about the prompting distribution? We're going to define the prompting distribution as we're going to choose um, a target concept, theta star, so we're going to fix it. And then we're going to generate from the HMM, but we're going to break it up into independent pieces. 
And here, we can have Albert Einstein was German, delimiter, uh, Gandhi was an Indian, delimiter, and, and so on. Right? So this part is generated from the HMM. And then once you hit a delimiter, you reset and go back to sort of initial state, and you generate from HMM again, and you reset and you generate from HMM again. Okay, so this distribution is different from the, the training distribution because it has basically these restarts as opposed to one long continuous um, HMM. And this corresponds to the fact that in general in documents you have topical coherence, you know, Albert Einstein, you, you have a Wikipedia page about Albert Einstein, and then in these in-context examples, you're sort of quickly changing the, the topic but you're sort of, it's still the HMM, but you're kind of resetting the topic um, in, a, in a sense. Okay, so, so now the question is, okay, if, uh, what will the language model do on these, this prompting distribution? And what you would like, what you hope is that the language model could still infer this target concept and then it can generate from this HMM, and then if it, if it, can, if it knows theta star, then you would be done. And you would just, uh, um, because this is, Maria Curie was Polish, it's just generating from the HMM. But the difficulty is the distribution mismatch. You're now going to condition this language model on samples from the prompt distribution. And remember, the prompting distribution is different from the training distribution. Okay. So that's the kind of the technical hurdle here. Otherwise, it's sort of just standard. Um, it should be clear that it works from standard Bayesian theory. Yeah. Um, so the hidden Markov model, like usually, my understanding was that like it's like you make observations and there's like a hidden state or something like. That. Um, so like you get a sequence of the observations and there's like a hidden sequence of states or something. Yeah. But like here, it seems like data is playing the role of like the hidden. But like, is there also like a hidden, uh, like, like you read words and like there's also a hidden state that's evolving in the background too? Like, yes. Yeah. So the the question is like, what are the hidden states in the HMM? I haven't shown them here, um, but you can think about. Um, let's see, what's the best? Um, theta is defining the transition probabilities of HMM, and then the way you sample this text is you have a hidden state and you transition according to the probability specified by theta, and then you emit um, given those hidden states. So I haven't shown them because they're sort of, um, I don't know, might not be interpretable. You can think about this basically, let's say one through you know, 50 hidden states or something. Okay, so the key challenge here is that the prompt distribution is different from the pre-training distribution. And, in what's, and here's a visualization. So in the in-context learning examples, you have transitions that according to HMM, and then, which are in distribution, so that's great. Um, and then you have these low probability transitions where you're like, here's the limiter, and then I'm going to start going from Einstein to Gandhi all of a sudden. So those are low probability under the language model because uh, you, you, know, you just don't see this kind of um, you know, text too often at, at training time. So then, the, the, okay, so then what can you do? So here's maybe the most technical slide. This is just still a sketch. So we proved a result which is, makes assumption. And the assumption intuitively is um, the signal that you get about theta. So the difference between the true uh, concept and any other concept um, was measured by kind of the observation uh, distribution has to be larger than this error that you get from these low probability transitions. So these tr transitions are the source of distribution shift. And if you can bound the distribution shift in terms of some separation, then we show that um, as in context learning works in the sense that as the number of uh, examples k goes to infinity, then um, in context like this, um, this language model will ultimately predict the right thing. 
Okay, so it's an asymptotic result, um, but this is sort of the type. So, so know that, notice that if you didn't have this distribution mismatch, this would just follow through kind of standard uh, Bayesian asymptotics, and that would be fine. So the key thing is that now you have this error that you have to account for, and um, under some conditions, this is still, still works. Okay, so maybe some practical takeaways um, you know, from the theory are, um, and you, know, you don't need the theory to make these practical takeaways, but it's maybe good to understand these takeaways and the concept of the theory, is that making the prompting distribution as close to the training distribution um, helps. And you see the large literature on prompting basically tries to finagle things, so that's the case. For example, if you prompt, if you want to know capitals, then you try to say Berlin is the capital of you know, Germany and, and so on using natural language, so it looks more in distribution. So this is a kind of a prompting trick. So you generally want to use the limiters that are like new lines or um, uh, pounds that sort of don't increase the probability of inferring the wrong concept. So through this kind of latent concept view, what you're basically doing is that every time you, you think about inferring an HMM, every time you're transitioning, this is sort of confusing the model. And if you have, um, instead of a new line, you say something like birth date, that's going to really confuse the model. So don't do that. Using something neutral is, uh, is helpful. OK. So then now I'm going to switch into some empirical um, studies here. Maybe the first is we built this uh, data set, um, generative in context learning data set. And the goal is to have something small so we can run experiments and study things without training, waiting weeks uh, to train uh, large models. And so uh, there's a pre-training distribution of 1,000 documents. Each document is just one long sequence, a sample from a HMM. And um, it's, it basically looks like this, so it's sort of gibberish. Um, just, um, and the prompting distribution is uh, concatenated independent examples. So it's basically the same distribution of gibberish with uh, punctuated by these delimiters. OK, so um, we trained our transformers and LSTMs on the pre-training distribution, which is just these documents, and then conditioned on this prompting distribution and see if it could predict the right answer. And as the number of in-context examples increases, we see that the transformer um, uh, improves. So k here is the length of an example. So here the k is uh, 3, for example. Um, and and we see that as the length of an example increases, uh, then things get better. This should be you know, natural because the more lengthier the in-context examples here are, then the more in distribution the, 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 um, this prompting distribution looks. And here LSIMs are actually doing a little bit than transformers, um, which might be also natural because this uh, data set is basically like a HMM. I mean, it's a mixture of HMM, so it's not exactly an HMM, but it has this sort of temporal sequence, and maybe that matches the inductive bias of LSTMs better than transformers, which have to work harder. Um, effect of modeling uh, s scale. So, you know, I think the scale is obviously a um, top of mind question. Yeah, question. So, at like K equals eight, I think it's starting to so the question is, as k increases, it seems like uh, this is catching up with k equals 10. Um, I think it's just the diminishing uh, gains that you get, because 8 and 10 aren't that different. But if going from 3 to 5 is almost you know, like doubling the size. Um, and if k equals 1, then you don't, really don't have much information. Um, yeah, there's some noise here, so um, yeah. OK, so what happens when you um, increase the model scale? So you know, things, the common refrain is that when models get better, things get better. But one thing that's interesting is that 
the in-context accuracy will get better as you improve them, increase the model size, let's say from 12 to 16. But um, the validation loss or the, the pre-training loss is the same. So this is sort of interesting because it's, it's not, you're not fitting the data you know, better uh, by using a larger model. We don't know really understand why this is the case, but maybe just hypothet um, hypothesizing, maybe there's inductive bias for in-context learning um, that improves with model size. You know, not really sure. Um, then we look at some, we're trying to sort of see whether this data set kind of captures a lot of the phenomena that you see in the literature. Um, so there's this peculiar thing in the GPT-3 paper that zero shot is sometimes better than one shot for some you know, data sets. And you see the same thing kind of happen in you know, uh, Jink as well, uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, there's this a paper um, that did a really interesting experiment. Um, so this is for the skeptics of in-context learning, like, okay, are you actually doing in-context learning or not? Um, yeah, question. Is the reason why zero-shot learning is better than modular learning that the model simply copies the answer uh, for the first two-shot example? So for example, for multiple choice, I could see that maybe the answer is B, the model simply copies the word, um, that answer, or it makes it first to Yeah, so the question is, is zero-shot better than one-shot just simply because the model is copying um, the last answer? And that's generally, I think, the, what happens because you have only one example then so the model can't really tell the difference between, okay, I, the constant function where I always want to output this answer versus actually doing some in-context uh, learning. Yeah. Um, so, so this is an interesting experiment. So they took um, the sentiment you know, uh, data set, and what they did was just randomize the labels. So I'm just going to randomly replace positive, neutral, negative with some other labels. And then you see if uh, in-context learning still works. So if you were doing normal learning, this would be crazy, right? You would just completely get destroyed because there's no signal. Uh, but what they found across a bunch of different models and you know, tasks and, and data sets is that um, the amount of drop that you get from gold labels versus random labels is actually not that much. And sometimes, I don't know why this <laughs> increases, but GPT-3, it dips very little compared to not having demonstrations at all. So this is sort of interesting. So clearly, you know, in-context learning, sort of different from normal supervised learning. Um, one way you can kind of see this through the, the Bayesian lens is that, um, is that the in-context inputs help us nail down what the target concept is, despite the noisy labels. So you're still conditioning on x. So that's giving you valid information about theta. And the only problem is that these y's are now just junk. But you know, this is where it's a little bit speculative. Maybe because there's noise, um, there's no information in them. So, so certainly if you were missing the y's, then that's strictly better because you're able to infer the task better and then you can predict. And if they're random, maybe that's sort of like marginalized out. I mean, not mathematically, but um, that's sort of the intuition that you're conditioning on x's and sort of the, the y's are just random, so they're kind of ignored. Um, so this is maybe one example where the Bayesian inference perspective gives you a little bit of um, insight into this empirical phenomena. Um, here's another example that don't explain, so this is very similar. So here, let's suppose in-context examples are, um, the task is to predict whether something's a sport, um, animal, or plant or vegetable. Um, and the labels have sh been shuffled. So they're not random, but they're sort of deterministically um, shuffled. And in this case, um, you know, GPT-3 is actually able to um, respect that shuffling. So this is something that's not captured by our framework because uh, this is sort of a more of an abstract kind of reasoning capability um, that GPT-3 has where it's able to associate sort of 
basically do variable binding. It's like basically sport is just a variable that has a particular meaning in this context, and I'm going to use it consistently to mean that thing, which is sort of really cool if you think about it, despite the strong prior that sport is, is sport. Now, in this context, it's, I guess, vegetable. So, mysteries. OK. Let me try to summarize this section. So I want to argue that Bayesian inference is a useful way to think about in-context learning because really Bayesian inference is all about conditioning. And in-context learning, all you're doing is conditioning on your in-context samples. Um, and in Bayesian inference, the key object is this, of a serial predictive distribution, which is exactly the thing that uh, you know, you're trying to approximate when you're training a model to do in-context learning. The main challenge is to analyze um, the case where the pre-training and the prompting distribution are just you know, different. We showed some kind of mild theoretical progress why if you bound the errors of the transitions then of the low probability transitions, then you can prove something you know, reasonable. Um, one th important note is that all these results here in the second part of the talk are independent of the, the architecture. And I, I think this is interesting because now understanding in-context learning is, through this lens, is all about understanding the differences between you know, the pre-training distribution and the prompting distribution, which you have analytical. So there's no like sample complexity. It's just like these two distributions. And what happens if you condition on a draw from an OOD distribution and ask the model to uh, predict on your kind of ID distribution? And this might be useful for understanding the role of data. Because if you think about the role of data, you want to solve these tasks. You have the web corpora. Maybe there's a way to use this framework to understand um, you know, data distributions and their relationships. And we also have this uh, small synthetic data set, which is based on a mixture of HMMs, which um, hopefully can allow you to run experiments really quickly and assess uh, and answer some questions. OK, so to wrap it up, um, we looked at three uh, or two uh, different projects. One is to understand the, um, whether transformers can do in-context learning of a function class. And the second, um, thinking about uh, in-context learning as Bayesian inference. Um, so final slide here. So in-context learning is, I think, one of these great mysteries, I think, that we have in modern AI. And it's, it's sort of becoming a foundation for many AI applications. So people are using them to just build new application, and increasingly applications that didn't exist before because you can kind of spin them up so quickly. And I think understanding is certainly lacking. And I think it's, it's sort of key to make, both making scientific progress, but also engineering better systems. Because these in-context learning systems are not reliable. Right? We don't understand how they work, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And this talk takes a particular view uh, that you know, synthetic setups can help us more rigorously explore. So I think it's also valuable to run real experiments on real data, and you know, we're doing a bunch of that. But you know, there's only so much kind of handle you can get on what's going on. And I think we've gotten a few insights into the role of model architectures and the role of data distributions by focusing on this much more controlled uh, setting. And now the big open question is, you know, what of this can you kind of link up with the real uh, world settings, um, which bring in knowledge and prior knowledge? And there's clearly um, a bunch of things, phenomena that are not captured here. And there's more beyond in-context learning. So there's other emergent phenomena, such as chain of thought, ability to do arithmetic, a lot of other things that are hidden inside these large language models, which you know, are waiting to be kind of discovered. So it's like really kind of exciting because it's doing like scientific dis discovery rather than um, purely engineering. And maybe one final thought is that you know, we're kind of scrapping the idea of a, of a task, which has been so central to machine learning. Because what these language models allow you to do is sort of define, not just define tasks on the fly, 
but sort of fluidly go between tasks. Like we, when you have you know, instructions, um, which we haven't really analyzed or you know, talked about, paired with you know, maybe a few examples, that feels like that's maybe one task, but then um, the idea that it's just a language model. There's no, it doesn't have a notion of a task specifically, which means that maybe having a task-based framing could be too um, limited to understand kind of truly what's, what's happening in the language model. Um, so I'll end there and happy to take questions. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to use knowledge distillation to take some of the learnings from context of learning and fine tuning on my move it more into the fine tuning review? So the question is, can you use knowledge distillation to move things more into the fine tuning re regime? Uh, so maybe, well, one, uh, one answer is that I think there's a great deal of interest in taking language models and doing additional fine tuning to improve their in-context learning behaviors. So this is typically what happens when people do what is called instruction tuning, where you have you know, example, things that look like more like tasks. Um, and this definitely helps. And it helps um, quite a bit more than just scaling up. Um, of course, you scale up and you do this. It's the best of both worlds. Um, I think it takes a little bit away the, the magic, in my opinion. Um, and for practical purposes, if you just want a good model, you should absolutely do this because it's going to give you a smaller model that's more performant. But I think from a scientific perspective, you know, the reason I'm, I'm so excited about GPT-3 is that initially is that you didn't have to do this. And um, which means that if you didn't try to do something but you incidentally you know, uh, did well on it, that means um, it probably can do a lot of other things beyond our kind of imagination. So this is a sort of a principle of generalization in machine learning that, well, if you don't look at, I mean, of course you can fit the test set and then do really well on the test set, but if you don't do that and you happen to do well on the test set, then you know that you can probably do well on new examples. And this is sort of taking it to the meta level. If you didn't, you know, tune on any, I guess in meta learning, you could well, classically you can say, okay, well, I'm not going to train on a task, and um, now I'm going to, um, you know, and then and I've happened to do well on some tasks, I'll probably do well on other tasks. But this is sort of going on another level, which is like, okay, there's no notion of task, and you see some of the things that GPT-3 can do, like write um, uh, a poem in the style of Shakespeare about in-context learning or something. And, or do derive explanations. And so these are things that, um, you know, like explaining something isn't a task, in, in, in a, at least in a traditional sense. It's sort of a capability that's coupled with other things. And these things actually do compose in a way. So I think getting out of the sort of X to Y mindset could help you uh, maybe unravel some of these other deeper structures. Of course, this talk is completely about XY pairs, so just to be clear. But I think there's much more to do beyond this. Um, yeah. yeah. I have one question about the example you had with the label reshuffling. So you were saying how when you relabel or like shuffled up the labels for the sport and the course and things like that, you were able to like latch onto that really well. But how does that work? Yeah, this example here, yeah. yeah. So, so it's pretty impressive that it kind of ignored its priors but then followed the most recent prompt. But then I imagine that there's, if there's any label noise, I'm not confused what we're doing here. So if you have like a cucumber to plant vegetable and then beet to sport in the test, would it kind of guess the fifty or would it commit to one? Yeah, so the question is what happens if you have noise in your labels? Um, I don't know. What would happen? I think, it, I mean, if, I mean, what's a kind of the optimal thing to do? It's probably to balance the two somehow. Like if you have just like a little bit of noise, then um, maybe you would just kind of ignore it. Um, 
the random label result shows that it's sort of robust to noise and labels. Um, and so maybe there, if there's a kind of deterministic structure where it's not random noise, but if you're like flipping, then it latches onto that structure. But if there's no patterns there, then you just ignore it. That would be what I would hope that happens. And I wouldn't be surprised if it happens. But you know, I, I think you would need to run a more careful experiment to know for sure. Yeah. And what about in context learning with like visual concepts? Because a lot of the talk was about language, and a lot of meta learning traditionally has been on vision. So I'm just curious, um, yeah, about the vision because it's also like different modalities. Does in context learning happen in different modalities, or is there something about something special about concepts and symbols and stuff? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, uh, what about vision? And does in-context learning happen in, in vision? Um, so that area is much less developed than in language, because we don't have like a public GPT-3 that everyone can play with. You know, Flamingo uh, from DeepMind, I guess, is a big um, model that can do some in-context learning um, for visual inputs. Um, but uh, it's you know, no one has access to it um, publicly. Um, I do think that. Something about language definitely makes in-context learning more natural and easier um, in the sense that you think about language as you know, inputs, typically, like here's a movie review, you classify it. But language is also sort of uh, operating at a meta level. Right? That's the power of language is that it can, you can describe tasks. And, uh, and a lot of you know, the internet probably has things that do look like tasks. I mean, it has to. Otherwise, it, it's not. It's only limits to magic, I guess. Um, so there's, so there's probably a lot of um, you know structured things that about language that make in context learning work. Now in vision, um, you know, I w there's no I don't think fundamental reason why you might not. You, I, I guess the thing is that you know what are you doing in vision. Like if you're doing like classification, you're fundamentally going from like a kind of a continuous visual space to some sort of label space, which is sort of language in a sense. And and whereas in language inputs, you're already kind of in the language space, and that fluidity might help. But I don't know if there's any fundamental reason you can't do in context learning and um, in vision or what what it, what it would look like. Um, I mean, I guess you could certainly train models to do in context learning and vision. Now that I have, you know, a very high faith in the transformer to learn complicated things. Whether it emerges naturally from crawling the web with a bunch of images, I don't know. Really depends on your data distribution. Um, Chelsea, you mentioned that um, that in context learning has a lot of desirable properties over fine tuning, but it's also a lot less reliable. Uh, do you think that that reliability, like there are ways to increase that reliability, or is that just something more fundamental as a result of being self-supervised? Uh, and like, are there ways to make it more reliable without getting rid of the nice parts about it that's like fully yeah. self-supervised? The question is, can you make in-context learning more reliable? Um, so one answer is that if you do instruction tuning, you'll definitely make it more reliable, and this is what everyone who's actually trying to make these work in practice do. Um, but you still might be concerned because ultimately you're um, you're hoping that this transformer does something you know for you, um, and that part I think you know at least these toy experiments on linear regression shows that it's you know it under these pretty clean conditions it can learn fairly complicated you know functions. Um, I think that you know now if you have like you know a hundred thousand examples, you probably don't want to just like prompt a, um, a language model with those examples. So it's in, but then yeah, in, if you have a lot of examples, you should probably be fine tuning or doing some sort of retrieval on those anyway. Um, so I think this is, I guess maybe what I'll say is that fuchsia learning is shouldn't be reliable in the sense that. It's massively underspecified, so I mean, you 
shouldn't expect to do that well unless you have strong priors, um, even if you're you know, fine tuning, I, I would say. And in context learning is sort of in that regime. And um, you know, empirically, I guess, um, especially if you're doing struct tuning, it's not worse. Um, um, and if you're going to a lot more examples, then you're sort of in a different regime and you should be yeah, doing gradient updates. Uh, I've lost track. Um, here, let, let's sweep the room. I'll go um, with you and then sweep this way. Yeah. Are you just trying to grasp what the gain of like, having the random label is? Because um, like, earlier you talked about the uh, um, do you think it might be coming from the language that they use to s describe the label, and then it's both, and then the model was like, trying to figure out like what is uh, the task by the language that like showed up in the label, or because otherwise it doesn't. I, I'm just trying to figure out why yeah. it has such a big gain in like. Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, why is the random labels kind of working at all? Um, I mean, I think that it's really simple. It's by looking at the inputs, you can kind of guess what the task should be, I guess is the answer. Like if you look at these sentences, it's like, what, what, do you, what might someone want to do with these example inputs? And well, maybe classify sentiment. Um, and I mean, it's not obvious, like, it's completely obvious, but that has to be kind of the thing that um, you know, it's doing. Or if, like, I replace positive, negative, and neutral to, like, bench all fruit and something. Oh, and then right. also, words. Randomize that? Randomize the words, I think it should work, because, um, yeah, I think it but But I'm, well, actually, OK, so you have to be a little bit careful, because um, because if you sh put like a fruit, vegetable, then the model will probably want to generate fruit and vegetable, right? And then you're left wondering like, okay, what do these labels mean? So, yeah. Um, so in the functional space example, we actually had a like fair idea that we need 20 examples to actually learn the 20 dimensional like MSC okay. algorithm. So in, in general, like, how do we think about like, how many number of examples do you need in your prompt for the transformer to figure out what the task is? And does this, like, how does that relate to the scale of the transformer? Like, how many examples should we there in the prompt to actually figure out the task? And does the scale matter in this? Yeah, so, so the question is, here you have 20 examples, and we know that you need 20 examples to learn this function. What about in general? Certainly for real tasks, I think this is not really a, I mean, it's a hard and ill-defined question because like how many examples do you need to know need for translation? I think it depends on the strength of your task prior. Like if you already like one view is that okay, GPT-3 already knows how to do tasks. Or all, all you're doing in, con in context learning is prompting. Like if you're asking when's the, someone born, right? Zero shot, you don't know whether how you want to format the date. But if you see a few examples, you know what the date format should be. And that's all that's happening. So in that view, um, the number of examples is basically the number of examples to figure out the format of the task, but not this true semantics. Um, and I think that's not an inaccurate view of what in-context learning does. Because there's so few examples. I mean, some of these tasks are like crazy. And you can't really figure it out unless you, um, so, so you can think about the, the examples are there probably to f help you figure out what the task is. And for that, inputs alone probably do, and, and outputs, I guess, and the task description all contribute. Um, and then the, the kind of the real value of the examples is to really figure out like what the, the format is. And so maybe you could try to formulate a, you know, a framework around thinking about it in terms of what is a space of tasks that um, and the, how many do you need to nail it down? Um, which is, you know, maybe very little because there's just like a lot of common things that, you know, people talk about. And once you see a, like, an input, you kind of know, like, okay, it's, if I see text, 
it's, if I see code, it's probably going to be a code question. If I see like numbers, it's probably going to be a math question. That's not, um, you know, that gives me a lot of information about the task. And then you need to figure out the format. Um, so yeah, I don't know, hopefully that helps. We're over time, so we get to maybe take one more or, or end there. You're the boss. <laughs> one more, one more. Okay. <laughs> I was going to return earlier to like the whether or not your context learning will work for other modalities. Like I wanted your view on like what counts as like cheating. So like if I took a clip and I transformed the image into a caption, right, using representations this way, then like if we were to go back to your example where like you were doing these analogies between words, right, with like the sports vegetables thing, like does that still count as in context learning now? for a different modality. Um, and I'm wondering, like, where do you think compositionality plays a role in like, defining what a context learning is? So the, the question is, like, um, if you took clip and you turned all the images into text and then you prompted GPT-3, would that be considered cheating to declare that you have a in-context learning system for vision? Yeah, you know, like, you could um, a new label. Yeah. Images. yeah. It's just that like you're you're going to cheat the process of learning the representation. I mean, I think it's a very practical thing to do, and I think there's a lot of work showing that you should be leveraging these building blocks as components, right? I don't think you need to train like the mega um, multimodal that does you know everything. I think we have language models, and you know people have gotten a lot of mileage by prompt decomposition or chaining. Things uh, you know, like Socratic models from you know, Google has this thing where the models talk to each other. Um, and so I think from a systems perspective, yeah, that's, you know, that's great. Um, I think it's certainly not answering the question of like the emergent behavior. Because it's not introducing anything new. There's nothing new to say about emergent behavior if you chain things together. Um, Whereas compared to you know, this hypothetical experiment where you train on um, you know, web pages with the text and the images, and now can you do in-context learning with text and images and in maybe both directions, generating text and generating images, that's a much more scientifically interesting you know, question. Um, and you could probably, if you did that, you again probably lead, it would lead you to some new emergent behaviors that you wouldn't get if you just had, you know, GPT-3 and Clip. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's thank Percy again. All right. Thanks, everyone.